Turn with me then to the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. We'll be considering Jesus Christ, the heavenly eye doctor. John, chapter 9, verse 1. Give attention to God's Word. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siolam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the work of the Lord Jesus, and we thank you that you have appointed preaching as the means of grace. We pray now, O Lord, that you would help us to fix our minds upon you, that we might serve you with our whole hearts and love you. We pray that you would pour out the Holy Spirit upon us during this time of preaching, that our eyes might be opened to see Christ as he is, the light of the world. And we pray all of this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, my children have recently discovered a new game that they like to play. They're at the age where they discover new games. And the game that they like to play now is to go into the bathroom and look at themselves in the mirror and then close the door and shut the lights off and then flick the lights right back on, all the while looking at their eyes in the mirror. You know what they're seeing? They've discovered how your iris changes when the light increases or decreases. They're fascinated by this. It is fascinating. If you haven't done it in a while, you should try it. Your eye is an amazing thing. The eye is a, a, an amazing thing that the Lord has built into our bodies. You know, the, the scientists who refute evolution, one of the arguments that they use to show that evolution is impossible is an argument of irreducible complexity. Now, what that means is that there are certain things in creation that are irreducibly. You can't break this thing down any smaller and still have the same thing. The human eye is one of those things. The human eye cannot function if you take away any of the parts of the eye. The nerves, the rods, the cones, the iris, the lens, the cornea, all of it has to be in place from the beginning for it to work. The eye is a marvel of God's creation. And the sight of the eyes is one of our primary senses, isn't it? It's, it's the way we engage with the world, so much so, we don't even think about it. I mean, if you just sit and contemplate everything that you're absorbing, reading the very words of God, depend upon your eyesight. The eyesight is such an important sense that we all immediately take compassion upon men who are blind. I go to a gym in the city of Lynchburg, and... There's a blind man who comes to the gym. Every time I'm there, between about 7 and 8 in the morning, he comes in with his, uh, his cane that helps him get around. And everybody who's in the gym at that time, there are bodybuilders, there's people who are trying to stay in shape like myself, all of these gym rats, everybody stops and takes compassion on him. They help him make his way through the gym to the little piece of equipment that he likes to use, He gets there, he does his thing, and then he'll leave. But that's an illustration of how much we value eyesight. In the gym, this blind man comes in and everyone stops what they're doing, helps him, and has compassion upon him. Now, we have this level of compassion for those who have lost their physical eyesight. And how much more important, then, is spiritual eyesight? You see, spiritual eyesight is as important, if not more so, than physical eyesight. 
Without spiritual eyesight, you cannot know the truth. You cannot know who Christ is. And if you can't know who Christ is, then you can't be saved. Well, what we see in this passage is an example of Christ healing a man and restoring his physical eyesight. But I want you to recognize that as Christ heals this man of his physical blindness, this is an illustration for how Christ heals our spiritual blindness. In this parable of Christ restoring earthly sight, we're given a picture of how Christ restores our heavenly sight. In fact, we're going to see one particular thing. Christ, as the heavenly eye doctor, is sent on a heavenly mission and uses heavenly means to restore our sight. Christ, as the heavenly eye doctor, is sent on a heavenly mission using heavenly means to restore our heavenly sight. Now, a brief word of context, but also a brief word of explanation. I have called this the heavenly eye doctor, and I've talked about a heavenly mission and that our heavenly sight is to be restored. Sometimes the word heaven can be misunderstood. Sometimes when we think about heaven, we we misunderstand that as the scriptures talk about heaven, what they are really talking about is the presence of God. You see, heaven is not the place where God is. Wherever God is, is heaven. Wherever God manifests his goodness and his glory, wherever God displays his covenantal blessings to his people, that is heaven. And so Christ, in being sent on a heavenly mission and using heavenly means, is simply another way of saying that Christ was sent by God to accomplish God's work in God's way. And so we begin by looking at this passage. Uh, One last word of context. As we transition to this part of the Gospel of John, we've seen in chapter 8, there's an extended debate that Christ has with the Pharisees. And throughout that debate, more and more, Christ is telling them, I am Jehovah. I am the Jehovah God who manifested himself to Moses in the burning bush. I am, I am. Now, in chapter 9, at at the end of that passage, you'll remember, uh, the end of John chapter 8, the Jews are offended by this and they want to stone him because they recognize he's claiming to be divine, but they don't receive that. They can't see it. They think he's blaspheming. Now, the obvious question is, Why would they think he's blaspheming? Because they are spiritually blind. They cannot perceive the truth. Now in chapter 9, John is going to move into this entire chapter to unfold the principle of spiritual eyesight, how our spiritual sight is restored, and he begins with this miracle. He begins with this little episode. One last thing that I'll tell you, we we talked about this in the new members class, but it's an important principle to keep in mind, and it's related to the sermon we heard this morning. Remember, the author of Hebrews says that God has spoken to us in the Son, not merely through the Son, but in His Son. So it's not only the words of Christ that teach us what God is like, It's also the actions and the miracles of Christ that teach us lessons. Christ, in this passage, is teaching us a lesson through his miracle of healing. When Christ brought Lazarus from the dead, he was teaching us a lesson through the miracle. This principle holds true for all of the Gospels. So when you go to read the Gospels again and you see Christ performing a miracle... It's good to marvel at that. It's good to praise Christ for that. But you also need to ask the question, what lesson is being taught through this miracle? And now we turn to this passage to see the lesson that Christ has for us. First, Christ is sent on a heavenly mission. And when I say that this is a heavenly mission, it means that he has been sent from God. 
Now, when we say that someone has been sent from God, we need to ask ourselves, what is it that motivates God to do what he does? What was it that motivated Christ to come and to give testimony to the truth and to die on the cross, rise again, and reign in heaven forever? Well, the only answer is love. Christ came because God had love for sinners. And we see that here in verses 1 through 3, that Christ is motivated by love and compassion for this man. Notice first off, Verse 1, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. There's an important detail about this man that's given to us. He has been blind for his entire life. This was not something that happened recently. This was not something that the doctors were able to cure. However old this man is, and he's probably in his 30s, he's a grown man, he has been blind his entire life. This is a blindness that man cannot heal. Christ sees this man, and it's evident from the question that the disciples ask him that Christ is stopping and considering this man. He's looking at this man. He's contemplating this man. Probably, based on the other instances of Christ considering those who are sick, he's probably moved by compassion for this man. He sees him, he's blind, and he's having pity on him. We read this in Mark chapter 1 during the uh, providential interlude. When the leper comes to Christ, it says that Christ was moved with compassion. When he sees this object of pity, this man who is uh, eaten up by leprosy, Christ looks at him and is not disgusted by him, but has compassion and pity on him. In the book of Genesis, when we concluded with Joseph's death, and that he died in hope. Do you remember what Joseph says at the end of the book of Genesis? He says that God will visit you. That word in Hebrew is a word that means God will come and pay attention and have compassion upon you. Well, we see Christ embodying that right here. He sees a man who is blind from birth. He's obviously spending time looking at this man because then the disciples ask this question, saying, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or his parents, uh, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Now, we are not only the blind man in these parables, but we're often the disciples as well in these parables and these stories. The disciples ask this question, and it's a very reasonable and rational question. They they want to ask the question, well, this man is suffering greatly. It must be because of sin. And the question that they are asking is, what is the specific sin that this man or his parents committed that he should suffer this fate? This kind of thinking is common in the scriptures. Job's friends are guilty of this same kind of questioning. Job is suffering all these horrible torments and afflictions, And Job's friends come to him and say, you must have done something. Confess and be honest. And time and time again, all of Job's friends say, what's the sin you've committed? Confess your sins. Because you would not be suffering unless there was some specific sin you had committed. We often are this way as well when we see others suffering, aren't we? Sometimes somebody may suffer a setback in physical health, somebody may suffer a setback in financial health, somebody may be going through a difficult trial, and in our pride and flesh, we begin to ask ourselves, well, I wonder what they did. I wonder what's going on in their life. I wonder what sin they have committed. And yet, as John Calvin comments on this passage, when the same things happen to us, we don't ask the same questions, do we? We suffer a stroke, we suffer cancer, we suffer a car wreck, we suffer bankruptcy, we suffer a fill-in-the-blank, and we're often like, well, this is just a minor setback, or it can't be because of my sins, because I'm me, and the Lord loves me. He does love you, but what we need to be careful of is this pride that casts this kind of judgment upon those who suffer. Well, Christ answers, showing his compassion, 
for this man. Notice how Christ answers. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, a couple of things to note about this. Christ is not saying that this man is not a sinner, nor is he saying that his parents are sinless. That's not the point. What Christ is doing is he's answering their specific question. Their specific question was, what sin did he commit? X plus Y equals Z in their thinking, and they want to know what Y was. Christ is saying that the answer is not Y. There's no sin here that needs to be contemplated. But even though these people are sinners, just like the rest of us, Christ could have said, well, he's blind because he sinned in Adam. That would have been sufficient. That would have been true. But that would have not gotten the disciples where they needed to be. You see, what Christ is answering them with is saying, whatever sins this man has committed, whatever sins his parents have committed, is not the point. The reason I have come is to display the works of God in him, is to display the glory of God in this man's plight. Now, this is a very encouraging statement from our Lord. If you are like me, you have sinned. And in your sins, you have forfeited any rights to God and his blessings. But what Christ is telling us here is that when he comes to show the work of God in your life, your sins are not on the table. Now, I'm not saying your sins don't matter. I'm not saying God is not offended by your sins. What I'm saying is that the condition of God working in your life is not whether or not you've sinned. I like the way one of my professors in seminary used to put it. He said, uh, Jesus is an expert on dealing with sinners because that's all he has to deal with. And that's exactly what Christ is saying here. Christ is going to show the work of God to this man. His sins are not the point. The glory of God and the love of God for sinners is the point. This is part of his divine mission, his heavenly mission. It's motivated by compassion, but it's also motivated by his obedience to the Father. Look at what Christ says in the next passage. Verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Notice firstly in verse 4, Christ describes the purpose for his work or where his work comes from. Christ has been sent to perform the works that his Father commanded him to do. You see, it's God the Father who is the author of salvation. God the Father is the originator of the love with which we have been saved. God the Father is the one who sent Christ, and Christ is the one who obeys the Father in saving us. The gospel salvation is not God the Father is an angry judge, and Christ came on his own initiative to intercede on our behalf and persuade his Father to save men. No, the gospel is a work of the Trinity from beginning to end. In fact, the love of the Father in the person of Christ is the primary attribute of the Father. Consider what Paul says at the end of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians verse, uh, 13, verse 14 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Turn with me there. I want you to see this, that the attribute of the Father is love. Paul is concluding the letter, and then he gives a benediction to the people. And he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, you notice that he uses the word God in this passage. But notice also in this passage, the other two members of the Trinity are named, the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit. 
in this context, when God is used by itself like this, and the Son and the Spirit are mentioned in the same immediate context, God is a reference to the Father. So what Paul is saying is that the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you. Now, he says it this way because these are the chief attributes of each of the members of the Trinity in our salvation. God the Father loves you. Jesus Christ graces you with his righteousness. And the Holy Spirit is with you in this life and the next. Going back to John chapter 9. Christ says, I must work the works of him who sent me. How do you think about God the Father? Do you think about God the Father? When you pray and you address the Father as Christ taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When you think about the persons of the Trinity and how you relate to them, how do you think about the Father? Is he a stern disciplinarian? Is he a a stern judge upon your sins? Or do you consider him, as Martin Luther says, in the Lord Jesus Christ, you see the Father's smiling face. God the Father loves you. God the Father has compassion upon you. God the Father sent his Son to die for you. He sent his Son to do the works that were appointed to him for your salvation, and for our good. But notice also more in the mission of Christ, he sent to do the works of the one who sent him while it is day. Notice the illumination language, the light language. While it is day, night is coming when no one can work. As I am in the world, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now here we come to the problem that we have as sinners. Just as... Uh, that gentleman who goes to my gym has lost his physical sight, he cannot behold the light of the sun. He will never be able to experience the beauty of a stained glass window. He will never be able to see a sunset over the mountains. He will never be able to look at a uh, Michelangelo statue. He is not able to see these things even though the beauty And the glory of those things is shining out there. Likewise with the Lord Jesus Christ, when he says, I am the light of the world, this is who he is. The light of Christ shines from his person no matter what. Just as the light of the sun cannot be prevented, the light of the sun will shine because of what the sun is. Likewise, the light of Christ shines no matter who is in his presence. So then why don't people believe? Why did the Pharisees want to stone him? Why do people even to this day, having been exposed to the gospel of Christ, still reject it and not embrace it? Because we're blind. We are spiritually blind. We don't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear. We are incapable of seeing these things on our own. This statement of Christ should humble us. Just as the statements of God in Deuteronomy chapter 10, the Lord requires of us to love Him with our whole hearts. Now, why should we love God with our whole hearts? Because he's lovable. We should love God because he's lovely. Because he's glorious and beautiful in praises. He is that. The reason we often fail to do that is because we don't perceive it. We don't see it. We can't apprehend it because of our blindness. Likewise, in your life, I asked you how you thought about the Father. Now, how do you think about Christ? Is Christ the light in the midst of your darkness? Is Christ the one who sheds his rays upon you and gives joy and life and blessing in everything that you do? Or do you not think about Christ? Do do you not consider him and, and contemplate his glories and his love for you? 
He is the light of the world. Is he your light? Is he the lamp for your feet? Is he the light that goes with you in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death? If he's not, then you need to have your eyes open. This is now where Christ moves to his heavenly means. You see, Christ comes as the son of righteousness, as Malachi describes him. He comes to shine the glory of the Father. He is the brightness of the Father's glory, Hebrews chapter 1. But even then, men are blind, and so Christ, because he wants to save men, because he has compassion upon the blind, also opens their eyes. He also gives them sight to see his own glory, and that's what happens in this next passage. Verse 6, we see the means that Christ uses. Notice what happens. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, and then in verse 7 he says, uh, go wash in the pool of Siolam, which is translated sent. Essentially what Christ does is he throws mud on this guy's face and says, now go wash your face. He spits in the dirt, makes some clay, puts it on his eyes and says, now go wash. Just wash your face. You've been blind from birth. All you have to do is go to this pool and wash your face off. The simplest, easiest thing possible. Notice that the way that Christ heals this man's blindness is simple and in itself unremarkable. There's nothing remarkable about washing your face. I trust that all of us have washed our faces at least once this week. And I trust that in washing our faces, we can do this almost without thinking. Christ uses this means to heal this blind man, and in using this means, he's showing his own glory. You see, the means that God uses in our lives are simple. They are mundane. The means themselves are not glorious because they are heavenly means. The purpose of the means is not to show the power of the means itself. It's to show the power of the God who works through the means. There's another illustration of this in 2 Kings. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Perhaps this story is known to you as well. 2 Kings chapter 5. It's the story of Naaman the Syrian. And we pick up the narrative in chapter 5, verse 1. Now, Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back a captive young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who's from the land of Israel. So the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter of the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. Notice just first at this point, all of the glory and pomp and gold and everything that's surrounding Naaman when he's going to be healed. He's a commander, he's got mountains of gold, and he has a passport from the king. All of this glory and honor surrounding Naaman. Now he goes to the land of Israel. Skipping down in verse 8. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Notice that the purpose of this miracle is so that Naaman would know the power of the prophet which, in other words, is the power of God. Continue reading verse 9. 
Naaman went with his horses and chariot. He stood at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times. Your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. Go take a bath. Just go, just go take a bath and you'll be fine. Look at how Naaman responds. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Naaman is offended at the simplicity of the means. Elisha said to him, you got leprosy, that's fine, go wash seven times. You'll be as clean and your flesh will be like a baby's bottom. But Naaman, because he's thinking in an earthly way, he's not thinking about heavenly means, he's not thinking about the power of God working through the means, he is expecting some big pardon me, glorious display. I thought he would come out and pray and wave his hands and call down healing from heaven and do this big, fantastic event. I thought he was going to do this huge miracle that would have been a marvel to behold. And Naaman is enraged. He goes away in a rage. We sometimes are like this with God's means, aren't we? Just to give you a little bit of a preview of where the sermon is going, the means that God has appointed for you and I to grow in our understanding is reading the scriptures, praying, and listening to preaching. Nothing terribly remarkable about it. Go read a book, go talk to your father, and go listen to a man that God has appointed to preach. Nothing very remarkable about that. But those are the means that God has appointed for your growth in grace. Those are the means that God has appointed for your understanding to be opened. And it is in accepting the means and the simplicity of the means that we see the power of God at work. Because the means themselves have no power in them. But we're often like Naaman, aren't we? We've got an, we've got an issue in our lives. We're frustrated with some trials. We may have sins that we're dealing with and we think oh, I just need a new car, or I just need a new spouse, or I just need a new house, or I just need a new thing. I need some big, fantastic change to happen in my life. And we walk away like Naaman did. When the Lord simply holds out for us what the servant girl says. His servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, Wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now notice how Naaman responds. He returned to the man of God, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Through the simplicity of the means and obeying the command of the prophet, Naaman knows that God exists. Well, now we turn back to John chapter 9. Christ commands this man in the same way, go wash your face. Go wash your face in this pool. John gives us the name of this pool in verse 7. Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. Now, what I think is going on here, the reason John points this out, is to talk about The simplicity of the means. What this means is that the man was sent to this pool. And if Christ sent you here, that's where you're going to find healing. And so Christ, just like Elisha in the Old Testament, is telling this man the same thing. Now, as I mentioned, the means that God uses now in your life are just as simple and just as plain and just as mundane. The things that God appoints for your well-being, the first of which is prayer. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. 
Verse 6. A lot of reason to be anxious right now. A lot of reason to be stirred up. But Paul tells us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Go wash your face. Are you you anxious about something right now? Is there something that's got your heart troubled? Well, Paul's telling you, just go wash your face. Go to prayer. Offer up your requests to the Lord. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's a couple of conditions here in the prayer, however. I think sometimes we read this promise and we think, well, I've tried this and it hasn't worked. That must mean prayer doesn't work. It may actually mean that you didn't really pray. Notice how Paul describes prayer. Prayer and supplication. Supplication is a request that an inferior makes of a superior. A supplication is when somebody comes on their knees to the king and says, have mercy on me. But notice what else he adds. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let me encourage you and just challenge you this week and for the rest of your life. When you go to God in prayer, thank him more than you ask from him. Go to him in prayer with thanksgiving. There are many reasons to be thankful. There are many things God has done for you that you need to thank him for and give praise for. And Paul says, go to him with thanksgiving. But also go humbly. Notice that he says, supplication. I think sometimes we come to God and we're not humble as we ought to be. Prayer is such a common thing in our experience, we just barge in with dirty feet and not in the right attire into God's throne room making demands of Him. Now sometimes He answers those prayers because just like my kids, when they come in with dirty feet and jump on my lap, I love them and I'll give them the things that they're asking. That's because I love them. It's not because they're asking in the right way. Let me encourage you, humble yourself and offer your prayers up to God and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What is one of the other means? One of the other means that God has appointed is the sacraments. And in 1 Corinthians 11, he talks about the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. First, uh, First Corinthians 10, pardon me. The whole context is about the Lord's Supper. First Corinthians 10, 14. Paul speaks and says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. Verse 16, listen carefully. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Notice what Paul is saying there. If you want to have communion with Christ, drink this and eat that. Drink some wine and eat some bread. And you will commune with the living Lord Jesus Christ through the means that God has appointed. Finally, the last means that I'll point you to is preaching. There is a lot of discussion about how do you get the Holy Spirit. People are very confused. How do I get a hold of the Holy Spirit? Well, one of the things that Paul teaches us is that you get the Holy Spirit, you are filled with the Holy Spirit through preaching. Look at what Paul says in Colossians, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Notice what Paul is connecting here. The reception of the Spirit comes as you listen to preaching by faith. You receive the Spirit initially by hearing the gospel in faith and you are filled with the Spirit throughout your lives by listening by faith. That's how the Spirit is present in your life. That's how God gives you the Holy Spirit. 
Now understand, God has made it painfully simple for you and I to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you need more peace in your life? Do you need more communion with Christ to strengthen and feed you? Do you need the Holy Spirit in your life to guide you and give you wisdom? What the Lord is telling you right now this evening, go wash your face. Go to the means, pray, read the scriptures, use communion, listen to the preaching, and you will be clean. You will be healed. Returning then to John chapter 9, notice these heavenly means are so simple. They are so simple because God is so compassionate for us, but also because the means work by faith. Look at what the man does in verse 7. He said to him, go wash in the pool of Siolam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The man believed Jesus. Jesus said, do this. He went and did it, and he came back seeing. This is an example of what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To trust in the Lord means that you use the things he has appointed for your salvation. And what he has appointed is prayer, the word, and sacraments. But remember, these things work by faith. They don't work magically. John Calvin, commenting on this passage, says, there's nothing magical about the clay or about the pool of Siolam. There's no magical property in these things. It's simply the way God appointed it to happen. The man believes, and he receives the benefit. So let me encourage you, as you want to know more of Scripture, as you want to know more of Christ, as you want to commune with Christ, use the means he has appointed. And I'll say one last thing about this. Do not expect fireworks. Do not expect the prophet to come and wave his hands and call on the name of the Lord and to pray over your leprosy in a big, fantastic Hollywood set piece. That's not how God works. Because if God were to work that way, if God were to do those kind of things, you know what we would be thinking about? We would be thinking about the firework. We would be thinking about the show. We would be like the people of Israel when Moses made the bronze serpent and God used that bronze serpent to heal them. What did Israel do? They made an idol out of the serpent and they stopped worshiping God. So now in your life, he uses these simple means in order to heal you of your blindness and show you more of his glory. Praise the Lord and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ and your love to us as displayed in his person and work. We thank you also for the means you've appointed, which are so simple and are there for the taking. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to employ the means of grace that we might grow and be improved by it that ultimately we might see more and more of the glory of Christ who is the light of the world and in seeing his light we might reflect your light to those around us. We thank you, Lord, and pray that you would hear us. For Jesus' sake, amen.